Good morning. It's Witness Wednesday. It's Crystal Roy with the Kingdom Exchange sharing with you about the goodness and the power of God and what He's asked us to do on the earth in His name. And today I'm at one of my favorite places by the pool. Um, it's closed now, but um, I love to come here every day in the morning and swim. <clears throat> I taught people to swim in this pool. I introduced my grandbaby to swimming in water in this pool. And um, just had a, I have so many chats with the Lord swimming here. It keeps me strong and healthy, gives me vitamin D, and it's my, one of my happy places. <clears throat> and this morning, first thing in the morning with twilight and dawn, um, hearing my favorite sound. Um, my first sound that I remember was actually uh, the songbirds of the morning. I remember that when I was a little girl. It's my earliest memory, I think, waking up to songbirds in the morning outside my window. So I'm surrounded by nature today. Of course, you know, the cabana and the pool here. <clears throat> and I'm just enjoying. And I needed some light to read my notes. <laughs> so I found a light. But today I want to talk to you about the transfiguration of Jesus and your transfiguration, my transfiguration. We must take up his cross and follow him. We must take up our cross and follow him. What does that mean? It means that I'm going to give up my agenda and I'm going to do what the Lord has called me to do. I'm going to do his will, uh, no matter what it takes. I'm going to do whatever it takes to do his will. And that is what Jesus exemplified for us when he spent hours in prayer, even agonizing in prayer. <clears throat> he did not say, God, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He said, God, your will be done. Let this cup pass from me, I'm asking. I'm asking for this cup of suffering and death to pass from me, but not my will be done, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for everybody who's watching. Without my readers, I can't see your name to say hello, but good morning. Um, but when we come before the Lord, we need to remember who He is. And I've got some shocking news for you today. I don't mean this to be hurtful, but if we're going to read the Word of God in truth, illuminated by the power of the Holy Spirit for understanding, we have to come face to face with some hard things and let the truth of the Word of God inform our minds. And in order for that to happen perfectly, honestly, we've got to have a healed brain. I will tell you that I have loved people and love people uh, with brain problems. <clears throat> As you might remember, my oldest son had a tumor that ate a hole in his skull when he was 14 years old. He's had one quarter of his skull reconstructed um, because it had to be rebuilt from the tumor that destroyed. It was a destructive tumor. It was not cancer. Cancer cells literally have nine criteria uh, that determine whether or not they're cancer. He had eight of nine. That tumor had eight of nine. <clears throat> the only thing this tumor would not do is metastasize, but it would eat through whatever material it came into contact with. So I kind of liken it to, um, have you ever seen a cigarette burn? Um, if, when the ashes drop off, it'll make a circle hole, right? Now, <clears throat> if, if it leaves, if it's left there, and the surface is flammable, it will eventually flame up and, and burn away and catch the whole house on fire. But this particular tumor, whatever it touched would burn. So if it touched the, the outer um, covering of the couch, it would burn the couch. If it went through the foam, it'd make a straight line dive through the foam to the bottom of the sofa or couch and then to the carpet and then to the flooring and, and then to the ground. Uh, so it did not flash out to catch the whole couch on fire, but anything, it just continued to eat in a straight-ish line. <clears throat> but it would grow. It would grow out and eat what bone material, the duramata, 
the brain. Okay, we caught it, and it was corrected. But um, during the the recovery, during the the correction, let's say, during the the surgery with the drill, the saw, the pressure, that caused brain injury. Okay, so his brain was not as God intended because it had had some unusual impact on it. Um, I actually in 2019 had a traumatic brain injury. I fell on the job. I had nine separate injuries that had to be treated. <clears throat> but the head injury, as an adult having a concussion as a head injury, was very interesting. Um, uh, first of all, because you know, I had concussions as a child. I didn't remember those. Um, but to have a brain injury as an adult is a very interesting phenomenon. <clears throat> and it took a while actually about two years for all for all that to be settled and for my brain to be healed so when we have the mind of Christ which God has called us to have we have to first have a, a healthy brain and I want to talk to you today about the very first miracle that Jesus accomplished after being transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. <clears throat> and you might say, well, Crystal, that is from 2,000 some years ago. It's not for today. We don't deal with, you know, demons and things like that today, but I'm here to tell you that yes, we do. I wanna tell you about a story of a really good friend. Um, our, we, we lived next door to each other for years. Our children grew up together. And uh, finally she moved, but, but nearby, and then I moved across town, but we still got together. <clears throat> now with this good friend, she was a stay-at-home mom. I was not a stay-at-home mom, I owned a business, but we still loved to get together. So sometimes when, you know, my husband was busy and her husband was busy, I'd go over and I'd take the kids. So she had a bunch of kids, I had three kids, and our kids would play together all day long. And what we, she and I would do, she was very overwhelmed as a mom. Uh, so what she and I would do is we would clean the house and then we would cook and then we would eat and then the kids would play together. <clears throat> and by the time I left, she would send me leftovers for my husband, which he enjoyed. Her husband came home to a clean house and some delicious food. And I became one of actually uh, her husband's favorite friends. And he knew that I loved them and that uh, he loved me, she loved me. Now I wanna tell you they were uh, not only from a different continent, they were from a different religion. <clears throat> they were Muslim. Now I, if, and I kind of jokingly say, but I respectfully say, if you know one Arabic person intimately, you know 80 Arabic int intimately. Because whenever they, adopt you into the family um, you go to all the events and, and you you love them okay so I have brought the love of Christ into that community just by being me and I've enjoyed it and I've benefited as well I benefited from the friendship I benefited from the good food I benefited from just taking the Spirit of God into this community because I love my father and I want to share him with everybody right um, and I want to tell you uh, two stories about that. <clears throat> Number one is her uh, last child was born like 10 years after I knew her. And when he was about seven years old, I was visiting one day and he came in and said, you don't belong here. Seven years old now. Now remember, I had known this family for 10 years before this kid entered the earth, okay? he, a seven-year-old, said, you don't belong here. And she got so embarrassed and very angry. And I said, hold on, let's hear what he has to say. And I said, really, can you tell me what you're thinking? And he said, you don't have your head covered and you are not supposed to be here. Well, what she discovered that day was the hate that he was being taught in his private school. And I said, you can't blame this seven-year-old baby I mean, this kid's age can still be counted in months. Sorry about the airplanes. Mommies and daddies are coming home is what I tell my kids. Um, <clears throat> he's being taught an agenda. 
He's being taught to hate. He's not being taught to love. But we discovered it that day, and she was able to redirect him with his thoughts about me. Now, remember, I had not known her 10 years before this, this, this joker existed, right? This little teeny-weeny something who'd been taught in his private school that because my head wasn't covered, I was inappropriate to, you know, just as a simple way of saying I should not be in their home because I was a woman who was uncovered. So he was, he was being, he was identifying groups of people through how they dressed and their behavior, but he couldn't identify me through love. He did not see the love. He only saw the outer appearance that I was not dressed like them. And I want to say to us as Christians who are lovers of God, we must not be like that. When you see someone covered in a different way, or uncovered in a, in a body way, we must live looking for that spark of love in that person, in that Jesus nugget that exists in them. They just haven't met him yet, perhaps, right? So let's look for the gold in people. But I want to tell you the truth of something. When Adam and Moses and Jesus exhibited the glory of God upon their bodies that other people could see that glory, this is what God intended for you and me. Because Jesus said in John, oh gosh, 10, 17, for us to be one as he is one. That means whole, healed, lacking nothing, right? If you have one set of silverware, you have, you have all of your pieces. It's one set. We have to be one as Jesus is one. And then together with him, one in the Father. So we operate at the highest level that Jesus has for us to operate. But I want to talk to you about changing your mind. I want to change your mind about people. I want to change your mind about God. I want you to know our Father better, even better than I know Him. And when you get this, to discover parts of the Father that I haven't been introduced yet, I want you to introduce me. So today I want to introduce you to, it's going to be hard to hear, I want to introduce you to a God who hates for good reason. Okay? We call God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want to challenge your mind today. Why do we not call him the God of Abraham, Ishmael, and Esau? Let that drop. Abraham, we knew, was made righteous through his faith. That's what the Word tells us. Through his faith, Abraham was made righteous. Ishmael was his firstborn. So naturally, we should call him our God, our Father. The God of Abraham, Ishmael, and Esau. But we don't. Have you ever thought about that? I want to challenge you when you read the Word of God. Ask Holy Spirit to be there to read it for you, with you. So you can get what God is trying to say. The reason we don't call God the God of Abraham, Ishmael, and Esau is because Ishmael was not the son of promise. Ishmael was the result of our own agenda, doing things our own way, to try to fulfill a promise and covenant with God. Boy, that was costly. It literally opened a door for Satan to deceive and lie to and ruin not just that group of people who were offended, but for God's own chosen children to be attacked mercilessly constantly. Okay? I don't blame the individuals who are doing that. I blame the spirit at work in them. And we must pray like the chatter right now is about people from Afghanistan. Do you know what? Here's how I look at that. 
I cannot go to Afghanistan and minister. Christians can't. They're not allowed. So God brought them here. Let's change their lives for Christ. So I challenge you, if you have some Afghanis turn up in your neighborhood, ask God, how do I minister to these people and bring them the truth of who you are so that their lives can be changed, okay? I will tell you that, praise the Lord, Iran is one of the fastest growing Christian nations on the earth. I thank God for what I was able to do for him there. But when the Iranians read the word of God, they saw go into all the world and make disciples. Do you know where they went? They went to Afghanistan. Afghanistan is becoming the number one Christian growing nation on the earth because the Iranians read their Bible and they went and did what it said. And I challenge us as American Christians to do the same. So let's keep looking at this. Why do we not call our God the true and living God, the God of Abraham, Ishmael, and Esau? Esau. Esau gave up everything God intended for him for a bowl of soup. Because he didn't honor it, he didn't treasure it, he didn't protect it, but he traded it for something temporary. And the Bible says God hated Esau. Oh boy, we say God doesn't hate. God hates a lot of stuff, actually. You Google what God hates. It'll take you to a Bible verse that says, and these six things God hates. No, seven. You know, that's not a typo. It's to draw your attention to what is, you know, hold up. You could have written seven in the first place, right? This is not a correction. But it is a correction. It's a correction for us. There are seven things God hates. <clears throat> and he lists those things there. Jesus said, God hates divorce. That's not to condemn anybody who's divorced. But if you know that God hates divorce and you're moving in that direction, you need to allow the word of God. It just doesn't say it once. It says it multiple times. It says a man who divorces his wife brings violence on her. It is extremely violent. It's destructive. Satan knows it can destroy people. It can destroy futures. It can bring harm to generations. Now again, not to condemn anybody who's ever been divorced. God loves you unless he hates you. Let's talk about that. God hated Esau because he had worldly sorrow. When Esau discovered what he had lost and started to beg for it back, he only was sorry for what he lost. He was not sorry for how he rejected God and rejected the very thing that God wanted him to have. So shocking news is God might hate someone. Now, I don't want him to hate you. But you know how to change that. If you have done something that is motivated by your own flesh, that is motivated by your own agenda, and you only have the regret of your own loss because of what that person did to you, or that business did to you, or that policy did to you, like, you know, we got a lot of things we can piggyback on that. The policy of, you know, get a vaccine or be fired. Um, you know, the boss, what the boss did to me, what my wife or my husband did to me, what my kids did to me, what my mom did to me, what my dad did to me. If you only have regret because of what you have uh, been injured by, that's not godly sorrow. That's worldly sorrow that leads to death. And because of that, God hated Esau. I'm telling you now, don't be one who can be hated by God. Be one who can be loved by God. Now we say God loves everybody. Well, he does. I mean, he loved the entire world so much that he saw the trouble we were in. 
he made that penalty for sin. He made that sin penalty of death. But then he came and paid it. Right? It's like, <clears throat> I'm going to use something I deal with every day. Let's say a lender, a bank or a mortgage broker, has um, given you a loan. And the penalty for not paying that loan is foreclosure. But what if the lender then paid off your loan? You don't have to pay it anymore. Now that hits most of us, right? We understand what that would mean because many of us have been on that brink of losing our home to foreclosure where you had to make a decision to pay this or your mortgage, right? It has happened to many, many, many of us. But if the bank or the lender excuse me, said, no, no problem, I'll pay that. This is our God. He did make the penalty of sin to be death, but then he became a man named Jesus and paid that penalty, and we can be thankful for that. And when we find ourselves not measuring up to what he has said he loves and to be accountable for the things that he says he hates to not do those things, then we can be one that God loves through godly sorrow. So the word says godly sorrow leads to repentance or a change of mind, which brings salvation, which is healing and being saved, and leaves no regret. <clears throat> Don't have any regret. When you come before the Lord and you are sorry for what you've done to break his heart, and you repent, you change your mind, and you go do the opposite but the verse continues worldly sorrow brings death it's simple in the Old Testament the the Lord tells us I set before you curses and blessings that's the test of life and then he gives us the answer the cheat sheet choose life that's what we're gonna choose I want to tell you a story I started telling you about my friend who I'd spent a lot of time with, with her family. Our husbands were very much alike. They're both Middle Eastern. Um, they talk about my late husband. And one day I was over at her house and we were cooking and cleaning and the kids were playing and stuff like that. And her son walked into the kitchen and started to talk to me. <clears throat> he brought something in and shared it with me. And in the middle of talking, he paused for a second, maybe 1001. And then he finished his sentence and he walked away. Well, I turned to my friend and I said, what is going on with, I'll call him Sam. What's going on with Sam? She's like, what do you mean? I said, well, he just walked in here to talk with me. And in the middle of the sentence, he took like a 1,001 second pause and then he continued talking. And she said, I don't know, I've never seen that. Well, you know, she had a bunch of kids. <laughs> and I, I'm not saying that she was negligent in any way, but if you've, if you've ever been around a bunch of kids, you might not catch all the nuances. Plus, I had specialized training. I, I've been um, the private teacher for students with autism for over 21 years. So I had special training about how the brain works and how it can misfire. And I had seen that before. Um, so next thing you know, she's at the pediatrician asking that question because she honored me. She respected me. I asked a question. I recognized something was going on with the brain and when it was time to go to the hospital for him I think it was I think it was about seven or eight to be fitted with an ambulatory EEG to measure brain activity I went with her this is how close we were right I went with her to the hospital for that assignment right uh, I took her to the hospital myself when she was the patient when she didn't want her family to know that she was sick and her husband was overseas at the time I was with her when her now late husband um, was having surgery and I was in there with the surgeon when the surgeon came in and told us the scope of what was happening. You know, we were close close and what she found out as a result of that EEG was this young, beautiful child made in the image of God was having 150 seizures a minute. I'm talking about, wow, that's crazy. I, how? I mean, they're only 60 seconds in a minute. How can you have 150 of something in a minute? So it, it started a drama. Now, I'm tying this into Jesus 
Now, I'm not saying I'm Jesus at all, but I am saying I carry him, and I carry the power of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, where he had taken a couple of the disciples, and they had seen his transfiguring, they had seen him so surrender to the Father about God's will for his life that they saw the glory of God, because Jesus was not. They saw his glory. They saw the glory of God in him. And the first thing that Jesus encountered when he came down off the mountain was actually this story. This story I'm going to tell you, okay? And you think this happened back in the, you know, 2,000 years ago. No, this is happening today. Um, when he came down off the mountain of transfiguration, he discovered a man there whose child was having seizures. Now, in the Bible story, the child having seizures, the man, the man described it. He said, it knocks him down. It throws him in the fire. He foams at the mouth. It throws him in the water. His body becomes stiff. But as soon as the demon saw Jesus, it threw the boy into convulsions. Satan's like, mm -mm, I'm not going out without a fight. Now, while I had just seen a, a brief pause in a child who was talking to me, what the EEG discovered was multiple, mul I mean, 150 a minute seizures. It, it started to progress. It did throw him actually into a pool. I'm here at a pool. It threw him into a pool one time. I didn't throw him into a fire because they weren't really around fires, but it could have. Uh, it, it was starting to ruin this whole family's life. I'm going to tell you something even more shocking. She would travel back and forth to her country of origin uh, for, you know, like a month to visit family. And she uh, was there. I knew she was there visiting. And I got a phone, an international phone call. I'm talking, this was in the 80s, 90s. This was in the 90s. Uh, much less prevalent. I mean, now you can call anybody anytime, but in the 90s, you had to have a phone card and things like that to make that call. And I got this phone call from her. She was calling me from overseas. And, of course, she was trying to figure out this problem uh, the best way she could with the tools that she had. Um, with, within the Muslim religion, they definitely believed in curses. Um, Satan knows. Satan knows how to, how to control you. Uh, but she said, Crystal, I'm calling you because I have gone to see, I'm going to say a shaman. That might not be the right word. I've gone to see a shaman about this situation with my son. And he told me that there's a black magic curse on him. And he told me that I told him where you live. You live beside the person he's indicated. And that this, this, these were true. He said, there's something in the tree in the front yard, and if you go outside, you can confirm that. I'm, this is a wall phone. This is a, uh, you know, my cord's not going anywhere. I'm like, what? Because I lived beside this lady for nine years, and she was from the same country. They knew each other, and they were family, like distant cousins had married each other. So this husband and her husband, my friend's husband, were probably second cousins. I don't remember all that. Second cousin once removed stuff. But they were related. And so I'm, I'm hearing this weird news from across the world. And I said, okay, hold on a minute. I'll go check the tree. Because, you know, she was my friend. I loved her. I wanted to help. I believed her because I knew her. And I walked out my front door. And honestly, I was shocked. I was certain I was going to find nothing in that tree. I thought, this is crazy. This is Satan. This is just deception. But I went outside. It was, it was, it was, it was not a long look. And I saw a broom hanging in the tree. I mean, that in itself is weird. If I'd have casually gone out to my car that morning and had seen that, I would think, well, kids have done something crazy. They've thrown a broom in the tree. I don't know how all these things work, but I know how Jesus works. I will tell you this. I went inside, and I picked up that phone, and I said, You are right. There is a broom in this tree. 
Now remember, she was a Muslim. I was not being bold with what I was saying, per se, because I did not want to be thrown out of the home and the family, but I would, I would delicately, gently speak about my Jesus. <clears throat> but after that, it was game on. I'm like, mm -mm, no. So I want to tell you what happened next. I began to pray earnestly. And you know, the Bible says the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And the Lord taught me what all those things mean. What is a righteous man, right? Uh, I'm not perfect at all, but am I righteous? Oh, yes. The Lord has made me righteous. I am the righteousness of Christ Jesus. And that means I'm in right standing with him. I am properly under his authority. And what I think, say, do, see, hear, and every part of my life, right? When I'm in private, I'm the same person as I am in public. There's always room for improvement, obviously. But I began to pray in earnest. And you know what? That young man was healed. He was completely healed. He was able to get a driver's license. When you're having that many seizures in a minute, you your life is done. And I have the pleasure of working with him right now to get a home for him and his future bride. He's getting married before the end of the year, and I praise God for that. Now you read you read this King James or whatever your favorite. You know King James is what Jesus read, but read your favorite version of the Bible, where Jesus said, "How much longer do I have to be with you?" <laughs> I mean, let's just get real. When he came down off that mountain, filled with the glory of God, which gave him the power to endure his assignment and to glorify his Father, he was met with a problem. This, this Father says, hey, my son needs your help, and your disciples weren't able to take care of this problem. And Jesus said, how much longer do I have to be with you? I mean, have you ever been frustrated as a parent? How, how many times do I have to tell you to pick up your room, right? We can certainly understand what Jesus was telling us. He was saying, get rid of your unbelief. Believe, people, believe. I need you to believe. I'm going. And you've got to believe. You've got to carry on. You've got to do what I've told you to do. You've got to bear my cross and your cross. Because it's the same cross. The cross is simply surrender to the will of God. That's all. So today... My cross is to surrender to the will of God for my life. So how do I do that? First of all, I've got to get with God and say, what are we doing today? And what will I not do today? You know, I mean, um, I own my own business. Uh, I had a friend who told me, I don't like bosses, so I own my own business. And I said, John, what you just said is now instead of one boss, you got 200 potentially, <laughs> right? Because now everybody's your boss. The reality is when, when you own your own business, everybody's your boss. I mean, yes, you can do something to set some of your appointments. And you can make certain business decisions. But ultimately, you know, what is God telling you about this situation, right? Am I supposed to work with this person or not work with this person? And I've had God literally stop me on a huge deal with a dream that showed me somebody was a snake and to not work with them, okay? So if I'm going to put aside my agenda today to do God's will, I've got to know what that is. First of all, God's will is for me to believe His Word. So if there's something in there I don't believe, you know, I'm not supposed to tear those pages out. I'm supposed to say, like this man said, help my unbelief, right? So this man had brought Jesus a, a, a tough case because the disciples could not cast out this demon who was throwing his son, and I believe it said his only son, throwing him down, throwing him into the fire, trying to drown him in water. This happened to my friend's son. And when I started looking at it from God's point of view, I'm like, mm -mm, nope, done. Now, I could not go lay hands on him and pray. I prayed in the Spirit, and I prayed in the Spirit, if you know what those two things mean. So the things were happening behind the scenes, and he was healed. Now, I'm not taking credit for that. I'm giving God credit. I'm giving the Holy Spirit credit. I'm giving God credit for making a way through prayer to change people's lives, even though they may not know 
how it happened, right? But God can take your unbelief and make it belief. But you cannot take hold of what you don't believe. So I ask you to come face to face with yourself today. Do you believe God's word? Do you believe what God has given you? Do you treasure your birthright? Do you treasure God's will for your life? Or are you saying, that's too hard, that's not what I thought it would look like, so I'm walking away from that. No. You have to change your unbelief to belief. Jesus said in Matthew 17, 17, where is your faith? And in verse 20, Jesus is telling us they couldn't cast out this demon because of their lack of of faith. So I challenge you today, increase your faith. What are you believing for? What do you think can't? Let's start with what you think cannot happen. But did God say something about that thing? What, is, what are his words? Stop talking about what cannot happen. You know, I grew up with a front porch. You guys that are my age, who are my age, might not have sat around multiple generations talking about different things and you know, there's a time the TV went off. It doesn't go off now. We can entertain ourselves to death. And that has literally happened. But there was a time when we believed in things that we don't believe in now. If you haven't seen it work, oh, one, one big thing is marital restoration. You know why people and pastors don't believe in it? They haven't seen it work. Because they haven't seen people who would truly submit to the will of God in their marriage and not just in their wants and their desires. But if you are able to do something, this man says to Jesus, Jesus said, what do you mean if? So when you look at something in your life today, first of all, get with God and say, what are we doing today? He might say rest. And you ask him, how do you do that? Because I got to go to work. And he's going to say you rest in your heart and in your spirit as you do your work. Or he might say, like a friend said yesterday, the Lord told her to go get her nails done. <gasps> he wanted her to pamper herself. That was wonderful. But he, he didn't tell me to do that. <laughs> right now, I'm, I'm on a spending freeze. But if you are able, Father, show us what we should grab hold of today. Father, give us the strength, the boldness, the courage the belief to go after what you have for us today. Jesus said, if you are able to believe, all things are possible for the believer. I just want to ask you a question. It's going to be hard to hear. Are you an unbelieving believer? You believe it's not going to work. Well, that's fear talking. That's Satan talking. It's not going to work. It can't possibly work can't be done. That's fear. It's not from God. Because the perfect love of God, if you bring it into that situation, will cast out that fear. And when you feel fear, all you're saying is, whoa, Satan entered the room. That's not me. I'm not feeling fear. I'm fearless. Because I have Jesus. I have Holy Spirit living in me, guiding me, being my teacher, my counselor, everything. Everything I need. So here's what happened. The boy's father said, I do believe, Lord. 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 Not Savior. I do believe, Lord. Help my unbelief. He's submitting that unbelief to the Lord. For the Lord to be his Lord and not his unbelief to be his Lord. That's where we need to get. Are you believing for a miracle? Do you need a miracle? Or do you need a miracle, but you're not believing for a miracle? Let's come face to face with who we say we are. If you are a believer, let's believe. I will believe with you. I will add your faith to mine. And there's so many countless stories I can tell you where I did that. From medical things to buying a house. I, a pastor, my pastor, will tell you. I, I said to him, add your belief to mine. And we bought a house. He was like, there's no way we can buy a house. I'm like, yeah, we're buying a house. Sweet Mrs. Pastor said, I'm not going to buy the first house I see. I said, well, let me tell you what you just told me that you want in a house. There are only two available, and one of those I've already eliminated for you. So 
Might you buy the first house you see? I believe you will because I'm a good listener. I heard what you said and I found what you said you wanted. And guess what? She bought the first house she saw. Not because it was the only thing available. It was the exact thing she had said in her heart she wanted. God will do that. That's our God. We only have to believe. Now, here's what happened. The demon shrieked and threw the boy into terrible seizures and finally came out of him. The boy looked like a corpse, but Jesus stooped down, gently took his head, and raised him up to his feet. He stood there, completely healed, even from the bruises, from the seizures, and completely set free. We must get here. Now, in order to have the mind of Christ, honestly, you've got to have a brain of Christ. These seizures disrupted the entire community. If you've ever been in a community of people and somebody had a seizure, everything stops. I've, I've been there. I was very young. I didn't know what was happening. I was like, whoa, this is weird. Um, it scared me because I'd never seen that before. I was probably 12. And this young man had a seizure. Now his brain needed healing. Just like anything else, if your brain is not healthy, you will not be able to fully conceive the mind of Christ because the mind is how the function of the organ works. So if you're dealing with ADD, ADHD, trauma, PTSD, complex PTSD, and I'm only naming a few that I have close experience with. And trauma-informed response where in trauma-informed response, something that happens that's normal in life, normal between relationships, you literally don't see the actual person in front of you. You see the other person who was your offender. And then you behave as if you're responding to that other person who's not even here. And then you destroy the relationship that you're with right at this moment. Now, thank God that's rare, but it is a thing. And we know that ADD and ADHD, specifically, uh, folks who struggle with that, aren't able to regulate their emotions properly. So the, these things must be healed. I believe they can be healed because Jesus' word tells us that. We must be a believer, not working with your believing, but working with Jesus' believing. What does Jesus believe? You must become a believer. You must believe what Jesus believes. That fire of God, that glory of God that Jesus experienced during the transfiguration is ours. Jesus said it so many times. The glory, I've given them my glory so that together they can be, we can be one. So you and I can be one. My brain can be one. And I'm just going to finish with this. For the last seven of the eight years, of my life. I worked two jobs. Last year I didn't have to work two jobs, finally. Um, but about three, two or three years ago, I don't remember, I was coming home from a long hard day and I almost blacked out at the wheel. I say almost because it was very eerie. I'd never experienced this before. I was driving. I was like four miles from the house coming home late, exhausted. And my left view just started black, black, slowly, like 1001. So blackness started to come across the right hand side of my brain because it was affecting my left eye. When, when my left eye completely went black, it was about to cross that midline for a complete and total blackout at the wheel, I think adrenaline kicked in. And I was like, oh my gosh, I almost black. I mean, not talking, I'm not talking about falling asleep. I'm awake, I'm sleepy, I'm sleepy, I'm asleep. No, I'm talking about blackout. But when it almost crossed that midline to go to a full blackout, seeing black at the wheel, when I was awake and alert, but blacking out, when it crossed, just about before it crossed that midline of my brain, I think I snapped out of it because of adrenaline. <gasps> 
And I'm like, oh my gosh, no. Okay, four miles, three miles, two miles, one mile. I see the street I turn on. I see my street. I'm pulling into my own garage. I nearly blacked out. There was a brain incident that happened because of overwork. And I went to bed and I was so drained. And I, I really couldn't even communicate what had happened. I didn't know what had happened. But my brain needed rest from pushing myself too much. And we can do that. But the fire of God isn't for more power. It's for God's power. It's not for me to go do the things I want to do. It's for me to align myself with my assignment in the Lord today. But my brain has to be functioning. I can't push it to death, right? This is why Jesus got separated every day to pray. He had to rest. He came into the presence and power of God in rest. And I'm not saying don't work hard for your family. I'm saying do whatever it takes. But there are times when you're pulling somebody else's weight and you should not be doing that. I was guilty of that. I thought that was love. And I found out that, in fact, I found out the hard way that was not love. Um, I didn't love myself first. I didn't have good boundaries. I have them now. I'm working on that. The fire and the glory of God and the blood in Jesus' name is to burn up the flesh. It's to burn up the flesh. So in my fleshly desires now, of course I want I want to live in a nice house and, and that's God's heart for me. I want to, you know, be debt free. That's God's heart for me. <clears throat> the way I do that has to also be God. So today, I want to challenge you again. First of all, be a believing believer. Ask the Lord, what is my assignment generally? What is my assignment for the day? What are we doing together today, Lord? And then go do it. We have great things to accomplish for the Lord. But we have to have a sound mind. Jesus said he heals the brokenhearted. He wants us to be one as he is one. He wants our brain, our mind, right? Because the, the basis of how healthy your mind is, is could be physically your brain. He wants your mind and your spirit to be one. So the word that's planted in your spirit informs your mind to do the things that God has called you to do. <clears throat> so just like, you know, you have to put gasoline and oil and other liquids in your car, or fluids, I should say, in your car. You have to put right foods in your body the thing that you put in your mind is important too. You have to have the mind of Christ. The way you have the mind of Christ is you let the Word, who is Christ, inform your mind about your situations. So I want to bless you today. I want to bless you with what my grandmother used to bless me with. Every time I saw her and then she kissed me on my forehead. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you and give you peace. And may you always sense his Holy Spirit within you. So be a believing believer today. Ask the Lord to forgive you for where you haven't believed. Because we don't want to be like Esau. We don't want to be like Ishmael. We don't want to be people who God can't trust. You guys have a great day, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.